I realize we go by a Roman calendar time, but the Jews, in their natural recording of time and things of that nature, they don't go by the Roman calendar time at all. The modern Jew of today, yes, in all his political and economical endeavorments, yes, he'll work that along in with our time. But what we have here in the Bible is something altogether opposite. Now I'm going to read here from the 12th chapter of Exodus where this time that we're talking about begins. So let us read here, a few verses here, to get our minds programmed. The children of Israel have reached a point now that God is about ready to release them from Egypt. He's been, he's been setting the plagues on Egypt. Egypt is in frustrations and everything. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. Now, the month itself is called Abib. It corresponds with the last few days of March into April. It overshadows the end of one and the beginning of the other. The month begins by a new moon. The Jews go by a lunar year. Each month, they reckon 30 days to the month. It starts with a new moon. That's not the way the Roman calendar time goes at all. Even in their secular year, the day begins with the night part first. When sundown, now like we will say, this evening comes, the next day starts. The Roman starts Thursday in the middle of the night. Well, I, I, I can wonder now. That's why they sprung up in the night and they died in the night. The secular year starts in the fall of the year with the dark season first. It corresponds with the creation chronology. When everything was dark. But to get this tonight where it types and foreshadows the law that it was, God gave it to have a certain dispensation or time where it's applicable. Therefore, We've got to study this month, Abib, to see how it applies to the time that we read about later here. But let me finish reading here. This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Because God was now in the process of getting ready to lead them out of Egypt. And it's in the spring of the year. Not in the fall of the year. It's the spring of the year when life is coming forth. This set the type. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating, shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year, you shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And you shall keep it up until the, notice the 14th day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening of the 14th day. Where does that bring you in relationship then to that kind of a month? You're actually the closing of the 14th day. And you're going to be eating this on the beginning of the 15th day. Because that's when the 15th day starts. Now this sets a type. So now our first line up here is to portray you time in relationship to that month. 
It starts with a new moon. How many ever saw a new moon? Now, don't look at me like you never saw a new moon. You know good and well you have. I remember when this new moon appeared. We was going home. I just drove out of the parking lot. I said, look at that moon. If that's like what the Indians said, it's a dry moon because it's standing right up on end. And now then the Passovers fell. And then notice last night we had a full moon. Now then. So from the beginning of the month, starting on a new moon, 15 full days later will bring you when that moon is full. Isn't that right? Isn't that pro uh, practical counting? Sure it is. So then, on the 14th day, I mean on the 10th day, that would be along about in here, they catch the lamb and keep it up until the evening of the 14th day. Then they kill it and they eat the Passover. That's the beginning of the 15th day. That brings you through the ninth season of the 15th day. Now the rest of the time of that month, it's, ir it's immaterial because you don't even set a type. Now then, <clears throat> so we're dealing with 15 days from this point to that. How many can understand that? Now then, when we begin to see the year was 14 and 91, we can just say 1500 B.C. Schofield has your chronology of dates. So the children of Israel come out on the 15th day of that month, Abim, which is the spring of the year, and that starts the beginning of their spiritual religious year. And the time is 1500 years before Christ. Now, when we bring each one of these days down to a plot to the time factor, we're going to see that this full moon, when we break this time up to where it's represented over here. Now, I've got my best brothers and sisters. From 14 to 91 to 1451, that's the 40 years they wandered in the wilderness. That brings them then to the death of Joshua <clears throat> 14 to 25 brings actually to the, to the death of Joshua. Now from here to the judges, we come to 13 to 22. This is just breaking it down in the rough. This covers the judges also, the, the time of the book of Ruth. Then we come to 1117. This is where the Jews set our, our first, first Samuel. First and second Samuel covers this period of time right in here. When we leave 2 Samuel, we come then to this period of time. 1 Kings is, is, the, is the recording of what the, the time factor is. 1 Kings, 2 Kings bring you from this time to 588, that cl climaxes the 2 Kings. 400 B.C. is the prophet Malachi. And they, have never, they never had another prophet after that until the advent of Christ. Now that's taken 1,500 years giving you a breakdown of the days that this represents. Now, how many can see what I'm talking about? I mean, just in the rough. Each day of the month from the, the new to the fullest. That's 15 days. That's applicable to 1,500 years. Why is it set, therefore, that in a type, types and shadows, the law is full of it. Types and shadows was God's way of concealing these within the structure of the law that if they would have really been so interested to know where are they at in time, then the enemy should have never been able to slip upon them by pulling some gimmick on them. But it goes to show through the history of time, my, look what the period of judges was. Back here, brother, and said they had got so far off course that God was letting the Midianites and this one and that would come and oppress them. Then he would raise up the judges, and that covered a long period of time. Yet they would go back and observe the law rituals. 
And it's very evident. Even with the Gentiles today, in our religious denominations, they can look back to some of our founders, like Knox, Calvin, John Wesley, or all of them. They can look back. John Wesley said this, Calvin said this, Knox said this. But they don't know a thing about what the Lord would say for today. They're so tucked up in with tradition and their mind becomes like a man 90 years old. Hardening of the arteries brings him to such a, we will say, a senile state. He can hardly remember when Monday is replaced by Tuesday. I use that to illustrate. People can become so callous by just looking back because it all goes to show they're looking for an easy way to live their spiritual life without obligation, responsibility, and without being accountable to their own wrongdoing. And the whole history of structure of Egypt right from Joshua, right on down, was filled with long years, struggle, oppression, servitude, living in fear and hostility. Yes, they'd have their moments of revival. God would restore them. But again, they would go adrift. And I have to say, that's a pitiful condition. When if they would have looked at the types being concerned about them and say, what do I, brother, I wonder what this means. Well, it's not there for nothing. It's for something. And while we're going to send this to Jewish people, I pray that they will understand my tone of voice and my expression. I'm thankful tonight for what God has allowed us Gentiles here in these last days of the 20th century to see. If we would have stayed in the same boat a lot of the rest of them, we'd been just as ignorant as they are. Content to just slip and slide along with some old traditional belief. Saying, well, as long as I believe in Jesus. That's a Gentile excuse. But if I was to take that back in the Jewish sector, they might just grow to believe, well, as long as I believe in the Torah. And to my Jewish friends, please, I don't say that to cast any kind of animosity. Not at all. But when I read the New Testament, I read the generation that lived in the days of the first advent of Christ. They had slipped into that same kind of a at atmosphere. They could keep the Sabbath, and all the time they were sitting, twitching their fingers, waiting until the sun goes down so I can get back and open my store again. There was a lot of things that the Jewish nation, they got to the place, they would observe the law as far as the letter. But they couldn't hardly wait till that particular time factor was over so they could do something else. And Gentiles, if we allow ourselves to slip, we could fall into the same kind of a rut. And I just pray that we'll never do that. We're getting too close to the end. All types and shadows are now dovetailing. We're at a closing out. So as I say these things tonight, please, I pray. Let's don't just be people that can look back. It's wonderful to look back and see what history records and where we have come from in time. But brothers and sisters, if we cannot look back and see certain things, that encourages us, enlightens us to look ahead and say, God, help me. Because time moves on. When the sun set yesterday, it will never rise again on yesterday. It will always rise on a new day. And that's the way we have to look at things. So God was absolutely foreshadowing here when he gave the law to Moses on Sinai. 
that that which he has started by bringing Israel out of Egypt. Now that God has marked time. He has definitely set time in motion. And through the periods of time, through 1,500 years, think of it. How many times this cycle has been fulfilled? Every year, they slay that lamb. In the evening on the 14th day of that lunar month. And they kept it. Thinking and feeling, as long as we keep that, as long as we do that, that's all God requires. But they never saw the types and the things contained in it that pointed to ahead. Certain things you read within the structure of the law sounds like that it was a perpetual law given to never fade away. Let's don't read it in that light. Because you make the Apostle Paul say things that he never said. Wherein certain things are said, and it'll be as an ordinance to you forever. We have to realize forever is not eternity. Forever is a period of time. And that period of time is always set in motion by types. So as I've explained it up here, brothers and sisters, breaking this time from their departure, tell the advent of Christ, it's typed from here to there. In that first 15 days, when that month of Abib in the spring develops, and let me say this, that will not always fall within the same structure of days as far as the number of them. That can fluctuate, brothers and sisters, backwards and forwards. But that month of Abib will always start with a new moon. And that's why, brothers and sisters, the Passover season to the Jews, we Gentiles have never observed it in the, what we call Easter. That's just a pagan name. The Orthodox Church in the East kept it at the Passover season. But it was the Roman Church that changed it. To fit their, their, their carnality. Next Sunday is our Easter. And I have to say brothers and sisters. That's just Romans ideas. The Passover season brothers and sisters is right now. And that's why in Israel. They made spatial, day, uh, they made spatial preparations. For the Jewish people to be able to fel, uh, uh, participate. Keep this. Observe it and everything. To the fullness of the letter of it. <clears throat> now then, tonight I just pray that we can look back then and realize some of these types and shadows. Turn with me now in the book of Gal uh, uh, Galatians, yes. As we was reading from the different scriptures that Paul wrote this morning to the Romans, then in Timothy, comparing law to grace. I hope that we learn enough. There is no way we can take a little bit of the law and then hold on to grace too and mix the two together. And I have to say, that's what the, our Gentile denomination called the Seventh-day Adventist or what we call also Pentecostal Adventist. They hold the Jewish Sabbath as mandatory to us to observe. And to the Jewish people that this message will go to, I want to remind them the true, the true Christian church that started with Jews after the advent of Christ that he has departed and gone to heaven to be the high priest of this new covenant. The New Testament church began to worship on the first day of the week. Now people, well where do you get that at brother Jackson? You get it right in the 23rd chapter of Leviticus. So let us turn to the 23rd chapter of Leviticus.
in the 23rd chapter of Leviticus, starting in the 33rd verse. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of this seventh month, No, I'm reading over an hour. Go with me, brothers and sisters, into the sixth verse of the 23rd chapter. Because this was talking about the Feast of the Trumpets area that I want to get back to the Passover season. On the 15th day of the same month, just what we've been explaining, is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's Passover season. Unto the Lord, seven days ye must eat unleavened bread. In the first day ye shall have an holy convocation, meaning a coming together, a fellowship, and feasting around this. Ye shall do no several work therein. But ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days. In the seventh day is a holy convocation, ye shall do no several work therein. Now in this is a type. First off, brothers and sisters, the fifth, fourteenth day at evening they celebrate by sacrificing or killing the Passover lamb. But then they observe that Passover lamb feast by following it for seven days successively, eating unleavened bread. Now, in all probability to the Jew, it's unleavened bread, unleavened bread. And so they, for seven days they eat unleavened bread, but it had no meaning. But look at the type. The seven days eating unleavened bread is pointing. Seven church ages after the crucifixion of Christ. We should have been feasting on the unleavened bread of the gospel. But look what man and the devil has done with it. They have substituted the oneness of God to a trinity. That's leaving. Does not the Apostle Paul say, a little leaven leaves the whole lump? So when you start changing this a little bit to make it more appealing to the natural carnal-minded man, you've diluted and you're feasting on, un, you're, you're feasting on leaven bread. So in our Gentile world today, brothers and sisters, they preach from the pulpits a gospel that's supposed to be unleavened but it's full of leaven by tradition. And they've watered it down and diluted it down till they, they could bring any old duck in. I saw a commercial the other night. That commercial showed a woman dressed in pants. Jeans is what it was. And here she is advertising that she has found Christ through the Methodist Church. Now a system, an organization that used to preach sanctification and holiness, dedication to God, now that poor Methodists don't even know, brothers and sisters, what holiness is as far as the Word. But in the blindness, in the leavening of it, they're ready to tell the world of unbelief you can find peace here. Brothers and sisters, for seven days, following the crucifixion of Christ, the feasting on the natural unleavened bread was a type. All true believers through seven church ages should be looking back to the finished work of Calvary. Feasting, eating, digesting the unleavened bread of the gospel. And look at our system today. You can't change a Baptist. Watch the Baptist, he's always going to be a Baptist because he believes in baptism. He can think all he wants to. That just because they believe in immersion, that makes them like the original church. You don't either. Because you're a Trinitarian.
And it just goes to show, brothers and sisters, every denomination that has not moved on with God, sooner or later they set back, they dilute it. Because if you don't move with God, He'll take the light away from you. And then you won't even know how to make bread. You wind up eating, leaving bread. A gospel mixed with all kinds of carnal, humanistic ideas that appeals. Well, we've got to keep them in the church. And that's why they can't even keep their young people unless they have a gymnasium for them to play ball in. And they spend fabulous sums of money just to entertain their youth so they can keep them. If that's all you've got to keep them, brothers and sisters, they're going to spend hell wide open anyhow. Because it's typed here in the law. And I can see, brothers and sisters, when the, the Jewish people would get so callous, indifferent, the unleavened bread after a while just becomes a commonplace thing. It loses its spiritual touch. I'll be glad when this season's all over. I like mom's old, good old light bread. Now that's just a figure of speech. So now let us get back to here what I was going to bring us up to. So following the Passover was to be seven days. That takes you to the, to the 21st day. Now I'm going to go to the ninth verse. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye be come into the land, which I give you unto you, and shall reap the harvest, and reaping the harvest is in the spring of the year, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then you shall bring, now notice, then you shall bring a sheaf, that means a little bundle, of grain. In this days when we use combines, you can't ride down across the countryside and see wheat stacked out here, grain stacked out here in little shocks, which is, it's a pile of little bundles. But back then, brothers and sisters, a farmer, when this particular time of year came, his first obligation was, before he ever cut this grain to harvest it in the full, he goes out there, he takes a hand sickle or a knife, whatever he might have, and he cuts a little bundle of stalk it all and ties something around that. That makes a sheaf. To him in the natural, he just brings it to the priest. In the tabernacle area or later on in the advent of Christ, it was to the temple. Now, notice. That sheaf would lay there at the temple area in charge of the priest till a certain day came. And we're going to read here when this would happen. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord. In other words, pick it up and just wave it like this. Before the Lord to be accepted for you on the morrow, which is the next day after the Sabbath. That's the seventh day of rest in the Jewish chronology. We can say it's like Saturday today. Keep in mind, the Jews in the original never had days named of the week. They just named the first, second, third, and second, and so on up. It's the Greeks that gives us the name of our days of seven. But now the point is, this sheaf was to be offered the next day after the Sabbath day that fell in that Passover season. Here's another type. And the Jewish people did not see this. But right here, brothers and sisters, lays the very core of why you and I have selected to worship the Lord on the first day of our week. Let's go further. And on that day, that's the first day of the week. It's the next day after the Jewish Sabbath. The priest shall wave it. When? On the next day after the Jewish Sabbath. 
Now let us come on down here, brothers and sisters. Fifty days later, this is when Pentecost fell in Acts. The 15th verse. And ye shall count unto you from the morrow, after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. In other words, 49 days. That's seven times seven. Seven weeks. But let's see where that brings us to again. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath. Shall you number fifty days. You'll find this in the book of Acts. And you shall offer a new meal offering. Meat offering. Unto the Lord. Ye shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves. Of two dead steels. They shall be a fine flour. They shall be bacon with leaven. Because it's such a beautiful type. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. Now let me break it down. Let's go back in the ear of time. Let's go back in this period of time. No matter what year we do. When we come to that Passover season. When that Passover season falls within, we will say the spring of the years when it does. If you're a farmer, you're to go out in the spring of the year in that grain. You do not wait, I mean, you do not go out there, brothers and sisters, before it heads. No. You wait till it comes to its head because it's coming to fruitation. When it begins to show its ripening, then you cut this little bundle. Because little do you realize, this little bundle points to Jesus Christ. He's the first fruits from among the dead. He's the first fruits unto God. He's the beginning of God's new creation. And I feel like I could climb Pike's Peak right now. <laughs> he is. He's a second Adam. The beginning of something new. That sheaf, in natural as it was, and the priest offers it on that day. But I tell you, brothers and sisters, 2,000 years ago, early in the morning on the first day of the week, I could just see the old priest down in the temple area. Wake it up. Oh, I'm so sleepy. The sunlight is just a dawning over the Judean hills. But it's about time I get out there to that pile of sheep and begin to wave them. It's all natural to him. But I have to say, brothers and sisters, from the palcones of glory, angelic beings are looking down to a little old cave in a rock. Angels came down and an earthquake shook it and rolled the stone away. And the first fruit from among the dead... Is going to come forth. Because he's the first born again creature among many brethren. While the natural priest with the natural sheath, I could just see him picking them up, wave them, throw them, pick them up and wave them. See, that's how natural we can carnally get. But that morning, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week. Read it in the four Gospels. Jesus had already risen before the roosters even crowed. And as he's risen, he's God's sheaf offering. He's the beginning of a new creation. And he's the beginning of a spiritual crop. So then how come these two leaven loaves of bread are to be baked and also brought to the priest to be offered as a burnt sacrifice? That typifies the 120 was in the upper room. And that was on the first day of the week. Seek of them Jews down in the court. 
And hundreds of them was on the way through the crowded streets to the day of Pentecost, the feast day. Offering, leaving loaves. Because the 120, yes, they're going to become newborn again creatures. But remember, this old flesh is still part of this world yet. That's what it all typifies. But when Jesus, before he had departed from the Mount of Olives, tarry in Jerusalem till you be endued with power on, on, from on high. And he did not tell them how many days or anything. So but they went right back to the same upper room where they had ate the Passover, where he instituted the Lord's Supper. And there they sat, day after day, day after day, day after day. Now if they had got impatient, and when the, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, he didn't count the days, but it meant when the, the, the natural aspect of this law the priests are ready to start offering these leaving loaves of bread down there. Hundreds of these Jews was on their way to that festivity. All of a sudden in that upper room, 120 Jews that has believed what this man has said, who is the first fruits from among the dead, and who is the beginning of a new creation, the family of the household of God. All of a sudden, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. They were Jews. And brothers and sisters, now to my Jewish friends that might hear this, you say, well, I don't believe in emotions. They did. They did. Because it affected them. All of a sudden, it filled the whole house. They could hear, shh. I don't believe in fanaticism. I don't either. But I believe in that. And it filled the whole house first. But it's got to come closer to you than that. And everyone became filled with the Holy Ghost. That Shekinah glory that used to be in the tabernacle in the wilderness, then in the temple in Jerusalem. But Ezekiel, well, prophet who was carried away to Babylon, was taken back there in, in a vision and shown where that Shekinah glory went to. And brothers and sisters, in the time factor of approximately 600 B.C., the Jewish nation had become so complacent in the rituals and the ceremonies of the traditional way of doing things. They displeased God. Ezekiel in his vision saw the Shekinah glory leave the house. And it is left. It went back over on the Mount of Olives and then ascended to heaven. And I challenge any Jews. Search your histories. That Shekinah glory never did return until it returned in that upper room. 33 A.D. When it came into that 120 Jews. Because now they are God's spiritual house. He has not come to live in a tent nor a building of stones. He has come to live in lively stones. Built up to be a spiritual house. To be a habitation. Not only a house but a family. Newborn creatures. From the new covenant. So it filled the whole house. Then it filled every one of them. And they all began to speak in another dialect. Read it in Acts. After a while brothers and sisters. They got so full of this. They were being so emotionally affected. It was vibrating through their beings. Like an electrical dynamo. And some of them began to become so excited. I got to get out of here. I can't sit still no longer. God literally drove them out of that upper room. Because now then, as the leaving loaves of bread are being burned down in the temple, here's God consuming them with Holy Ghost fire from heaven itself. He's accepting them. Because these are the first fruits now. 
Christ was the first fruit, but these are the first fruits, plural, of the new family of God. And here they come into the streets, reeling, talking in a language they didn't even know what they were saying. No Jew prior to that had ever done that. A mule was heard speaking in Hebrew one time. <clears throat> but outside of that, no Jew had ever spoken in a dialect brought about by the power of God. But here's these 120, and they're all Jews of Judea and Galilee. Walking in the street, staggering like drunk men. Talking away. They didn't even care how many Roman soldiers was around. Them Roman soldiers said, if you don't shut your mouth, I'm going to stick your sword to you. They would have probably just grinned at them. But think of all those devout Jews out of every nation on that day of Pentecost. They have come explicitly there to go work it towards the temple. Because there's going to be a big feast in the observance of all of this. I tell you, brothers and sisters, people today can get all enthused and thrilled in our religious, denominational affiliations, in our programs, as long as it has, we will say, certain religious inclinations about it. And it don't even have a spiritual meaning to it at all. So here's this 120 trying to make their way through the street. And here's all of these Jews bumping elbows, looking at them, trying to get toward the temple. But after a while, some of these devout Jews, now they were not fanatical Jews in the sense that they were just the general run of the mill? No. They have come a long ways <clears throat> just to be able to be in Jerusalem on this particular feast day. So they've set their goals on the temple. But as they're making their way through the streets and they hear this strange manifestation of these people acting like this, some of them have to stop. What in the world is this? And can't you hear that old critical bunch of Jews at home? Oh, they could say, well, they're just drunk on new wine. After hearing that few remarks like that, Peter says, Hear ye this, you men of Judea, and you that dwell in Jerusalem. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. See, guess it, it's but the third hour of the day. Then he goes back to the second chapter of Joel's prophet. For this is that which was spoken. And it shall come to pass in the last days, the last days of the application of the law. The moon is full. God is changing the order of events. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Oh, men shall dream dreams, young men shall see visions. Peter began to preach. He was so anointed, brothers and sisters, while Romans could have stood with a spear in his nose, he would have never even batted an eye. When he was done quoting Joel and explaining this phenomena, there wasn't just two or three come slipping out of the dark. Well, what can I do to be like this? They started crowding around him. Well, men and brethren, what can I do? And Peter said, repent every one of you. Well, what? I just kept the law. Repent. Because you're still a sinner according to the nature of your flesh. That's what the law really brings out of us. And be baptized. Reckon yourself to be dead to sin. But alive in Jesus Christ. And you too shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For it's promised to you, to your children, to your children's children. And as many as our Lord our God shall call even as many as our Lord that are far off and so forth. That was the beginning of what we've been talking about. The law itself has come to its full moon fruitation. Now let me turn you to Galatians. <clears throat> In 
In the fourth chapter of Galatians, <clears throat> Paul has explained down to the third and the, the beginning of the fourth here, all about the law, its meanings and everything. He has just said here in the closing of the third chapter, for you're all children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And to those that have come at it in this manner, he says, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed by faith. And heirs according to the promise. Heirs of what? Of eternal life. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because God's now been, God is starting his new tabernacle. And he's no longer coming down by the Shekinah glory in an old temple or an old concrete or a stone building. He's coming down to live inside of these vessels of clay. Now go with me brothers and sisters to the fourth chapter. <coughs> Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, he's pointing back to under the law, different nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. Because under the law, they were all considered under the same covenant. And the law was like a tutor, a governor, until the time appointed of the Father. That's meaning God. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, get this. When the fullness of the time was come, as the full moon was here, the fullness of time, 1,500 years later, the 15th day. God sent forth his son, made of a woman, or made, or born of a woman, made or born under the law, yes, back here 33 years earlier, this is 400 BC, but I, I just point there, but it's actually right in here, brothers and sisters, born under the law, and he grew up under the law. So we can say as a child growing up into manhood, there were many years he saw this thing observed over, 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 over. But he, self, he himself knew one day he will fulfill all of that. <laughs> Made under the law. To do what? To redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoptions of sons. Praise God. And that's why that 120 Jews, brothers and sisters, that have kept the law, kept the law from the time they was boys and girls until now they're old and adult grown people. They were under bondage, under the law. They could keep it in the natural, but that's as far as it ever went. But now in the upper room, this is kind of glory that they could talk about how it used to be in the Holy of Holies. What did he do? It come down and dwelt in the heart of the people. Brothers and sisters, God can't get no closer than that. And it can't get no sweeter than that. That's the beauty and the joy of it. And the sixth verse Paul says, And because you are sons of God, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts crying, Abba, Father. Hallelujah. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Now then, let's go back to the Leviticus. <clears throat> that eighth day, or the morrow after the Sabbath that falls in the Passover season, That type that Christ would not rise from the dead on the Jewish Sabbath. Don't let nobody ever tell you that. Christ, 
he was dead to the law. He was the end of the law. Keep in mind, as far as righteousness, the law did not make a man spiritually righteous. It was only to discipline his flesh and push sin ahead through the dispensation of time till the time came, in the fullness of time, when there would come one who would be the mediator of a better covenant and he with better promises. And to him and his offering. Now then, brothers and sisters, he makes it possible we can become one of his sons and one of his daughters. So now then, <clears throat> when we look at the types here, mentioned here in Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. Jesus rose then on the first day of the week. You read it in the Gospels. So in actuality, in numerical counting, what does that mean? If there's seven days in the... In the Jewish cycle, and the seventh one is the Sabbath. What is this morrow? Tomorrow. It's the eighth day. Right? So he rose on the eighth day to correspond to the creation chronology of time. And the Lord will, and next Sunday, I want to preach God's created Sabbath, what it types. And keep in mind, all of them seven creative days, it ends with these words. This is the generations of the heavens and earth in the day that they were created. And there was no, still not a worm crawling. And there was not a rooster crowing. And there was not a man walking. Well, Brother Jackson, the Bible says he created a man on the sixth day. Yes, and God rested on the seventh. But after he gets through rested, he comes back and there was not a man to till the ground. Now where was a man at? I ask you. There was not even a cow going to moo yet. All God has done, he has just spoken certain laws into existence. And I have to say, look at his angelic family. Watch them go to work. If God could say to angelic beings, let's make man after our own image and after our own likeness. Do you think the angels will say, wonder what he's talking about? Everything that is propagated into existence in this world today, whether it's a fishing worm, a cut worm, or a cockroach, they will none cross with another. Because there's laws that relegate and keep these species in their kind. It's the same way within the wild animal kingdom. And if you can see the spirit world, I have to say, out there, brothers and sisters, you'll see angelic beings. It's their authority to watch over certain laws. Nothing will cross. Nothing will mate. Only of its kind. And I, ha I say those things to defy these ideas that all exist, all life existed off of some little old cell life wiggling around an old stagnated pond in Africa somewhere. Everything that breathes, everything that moves, everything that has an existence, there's a God behind it. He's the architect. And when God rested on the seventh, he's done spoken every law. He's done set it in motion. Every, absolutely, everything that this planet Earth is eventually going to produce. And them seven creative days were not days of 24 hours. They were days that reaches into the thousands of years each. That's what you have to understand the word generation. And the word generation there is not pointing up here to our day. Seventy years is allotted to a generation. It's back then, brothers and sisters, when man lived almost a thousand years. And that's exactly why then. When he did then on the eighth day, create man, the first thing. And then he creates this beautiful garden, a little heaven on earth. And he puts Adam in it. And there stood the tree of knowledge and the tree of life. 
And God warned him, the day you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. Did he die in that day of 24 hours? No. But in that generation day, or dispensational die, he died just before the sun went down on it. 930 years of age. He did die, didn't he? But the millennium's coming up, which is again God's Sabbath for the earth. And according to Isaiah 66 and 65, it's going to be possible for a man to live the whole day long, a thousand years. So now then, that's why, brothers and sisters, when we turn over then into the fall of the year, in the seventh month, which is the month of atonement, this is pointing to the second advent, I mean the, the regathering of the house of Israel for the last days, the day of atonement. And it's coming about. And on the first day shall be at holy convocation, you shall do no several work therein. This is in the seventh month in the fall of the year. And seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. On the eighth day, see again that eighth day, shall be an holy convocation unto you, and you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord, and it is a solemn assembly, and you shall do no several work therein. My point is this. The first day of the week starting all over again is actually pointing to a finished work of redemption. That's why beyond Revelations 20, when we see the millennium begin, that's the Sabbath to the earth. And that's when the whole world will be once again rest without the struggling of an adversary dominating. But look when the great judgments is over. You see Revelation in 21 and 22. And I, John, saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth have passed away. Don't mean the same planet. I mean that the planet has been destroyed. It just means it's been renewed by redemption. And brothers and sisters, and when he saw no more sea, the planet earth will no longer have the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans. Through that millennium, somehow or other, God will absolutely brought everything back into proper perspective. Because the millennium too also is a continuation of what redemption is supposed to be as far as the planet. And so I have to say in closing my subject tonight, the eighth day, it's pointing to the resurrection of Christ. It's pointing to the new beginning of what the eternal age is when redemption is over. Now, <clears throat> and I want to bring this in because I've never taken the opportunity to say anything. I know that when they see some of these videos, they no doubt they see the manifestation of the gifts in our midst. I don't know what their comments is, but I want to remind them what God is manifesting among us started 2,000 years ago in that 120 Jews that was in the upper room. And wherever that 120 went, they became also influential for hundreds and thousands of other Jews that believe in the same thing. And even when we see that brought by Paul over into the dispensation of the Gentiles. And Gentiles, along with more Jews, are brought into this blessed faith. We see that same power that was demonstrated on Pentecost in the days of Jerusalem there. Now the promise of Joel is to the Gentiles as well. The gifts of the Spirit followed that church, that people. Because this composed and made up the mystical body of Christ. It's Christ living in a people. Naturally, down to this, the centuries of time, the church lost a lot of this through tradition, diluting things. They began to dilute and leave in the gospel. Say, this is not necessarily, this is not essential, that's not important, that all passed away here, and on and on and on, they say. But we can say this, God in these last days of time, has restored to us Gentiles not only the truth but an experience that makes this truth a living reality.
I wouldn't have it any other way. If this is the, the same truth that the apostles had, I want all of it. Now allow me. They know the dream that I had about what's on the chart over there. But I want to remind them that when I had that dream, I was also reminded when I saw a great gathering of Gentile people coming together from all over the world, I saw them carrying these little bottles of what looked like holy anointing oil. Now this little bottle of holy anointing oil is not to be interpreted that it's a little bottle stuck in somebody's pocket. It's only a symbol. That it's the experience of that same Holy Ghost that the early church had. I had that dream in 1993. Little did I realize as I preached about the nations and the signs when we come to the year of 1994 God was going to start pouring that spirit out. And I say this tonight in regards to the young people in here that have received this experience. This same experience, brothers and sisters, and to the Jewish friends. It, just only did, it didn't only just come here to Faith Assembly. This went to South Africa. It went to the Philippines. It went into Norway. It even went into Africa, into Nigeria, into some of the jungle areas. Because after this began to be videoed, these experiences, these young people and people was having, of speaking in other tongues, nobody shook them and made them do it. Amen. It was the power of God that did it. Amen. Nobody took hold of somebody and made them ship, uh, shiver and shake. I remember down in Mexico, <clears throat> when we began to preach it down there, and you talk about being slain in the spirit. I saw them come to the front and before I could get to them. They were already laying prostrate on the ground. Some of them, they had to load them in a pickup truck and haul them home. Now to the Jewish people, you might say, Oh, praise God, I don't want that. Yes, you do. I don't say you have to have it like that. Because in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, they were all sitting. But keep in mind, they were all filled in the Holy Ghost when they were sitting. But once that Holy Ghost got to steering them and filling them, and they began to talk under the inspiration of it, they couldn't stay in there sitting. They got up and got out of there. Where did they come to? Into the streets. Praise God. This had to be noised. And all of them hundreds and thousands of Jews come and go towards the temple. Stop. Listen to this manifestation. What did that do? It fulfilled a prophecy, prophecy in Isaiah 28. For with stammering lips and men of other tongues will I speak to this people, and yet for all of this they'll not believe. I believe in keeping the law. Well, that bunch in the hope of upper room had just got through keeping the law too. But now the law has become alive. So natural things have now become a fulfilled spiritual experience. Now here's the living tabernacle. Here's the walking tabernacle. Here's the ones that's going to be robed in fine linen one day when the rapture has taken them all out of this world. And they're standing in the presence of God. God granted that they should be arrayed in fine linen. Because it speaks of a revelation. And God lives in behind that. Looking at others through it. I'm thankful that God can live in our hearts. And he can write a revelation in our soul. He can give us understanding what it says here. He can show us what types mean. What shadows mean. Because they help to illuminate our pathway. When this went to South Africa. It came on little kids. When they would fall and lay under the power of God. It came time to break up the service to go home. In one particular case, two little kids, they didn't want to go home. They started taking them down on the street and said, well, I want to go back. I want to go back. Wouldn't it be wonderful if everybody would want to go back? <laughs> and so I have to say, yes, 
94, 95, 96. Young people. I'll never forget some came from Canada in a van. By the time God would get through filling them and slaying them here, brothers and sisters, they'd go back home, they act like drunk people. All the way back across the Canadian border, they're still singing in the spirit. And it's, a, it's, it's a miracle, brothers and sisters, that they got home without the police stopping them, finding out if they had been drunk. But I never heard of any situation taking place like it. I say that, brothers and sisters. Keep in mind, the religious world can get so glued and poured in its tradition. They don't want to be moved for nothing. And so tonight, <clears throat> I thank the Lord. And I'll say these remarks. When the Seventh Day Adventist tells you that unless you keep the Jewish Saturday Sabbath, that you are actually supporting the mark of the beast. And I say this, if these words ever reach us, the ears of a Sabbath day Adventist, you are absolutely talking in the dark. You don't even know what you're looking at. Because some of the Antonacian fathers, such as Irenaeus and Barnabas, who was a Jew, in their writings also taught, not because they had made a law, like the Seventh day Adventist says the Catholic Church did, sure they made it a law. But the early Christians, beginning with the early group, because they saw the type that it set, that Christ lay dead on the Sabbath, but he rose on the first day, which was the tomorrow, the eighth day. They choose by divine revelation to gather on the first day to worship their risen Savior. Because them, he's the first fruit, and they are the, the fruits of the beginning of the family of redemption. That's why, brothers and sisters, it's hard to preach certain truths to a denominational structure. Sit, died in the wool, so traditionally motivated, can't see through nothing. Unless the Holy Ghost illuminates their eyes, you just well go out here and talk to a mule. In fact, he might pick his ears. What are you talking about? It pays to throw a remark in once in a while. <laughs> Might bring a few smiles on some faces. But I thank the Lord tonight for His grace. Now then, how many can understand the law in the natural reading is still for the sinner? Ain't it? That's why Jesus said, and any man that teaches any otherwise will be the least in the kingdom of God. The, natural, the letter of the law is still pointing to the old natural man of the world, the old natural man that's born in this flesh, subject to lies and everything. But thanks be to God, God has redeemed us from the curse of that into this second covenant. He's given us a new life, a new beginning. We can't help but see things different. So I just pray tonight, brothers and sisters, that what's been said, that you can be understood. Heavenly Father, I know there can be many, many more things said. And I pray for the Jewish people, Lord. You have brought many back, Lord, somehow or other to prepare them for the end time. And we're praying for them tonight, Lord, that somehow or other you will visit them Protect them, Lord. Give them an insight. Lord, let them receive a new beginning, a new experience that, God, they might share with the church. Not to be like a Gentile, but they could be like the same Jews that started this thing 2,000 years ago. And that they might be the means that, God, you will complete this cycle and this circle. Because, Lord, one of these days you're going to take the church out of this world. While this world goes on into that chaotic hour 
of sadness, a time of trouble such as there never was before. So, Lord, I thank you tonight. May you be praised and glorified. In the blessed name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. May the Lord be praised tonight. What a friend we have in Jesus. Oh, our sin.